Fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much for showing up here late in the day on the second day of the conference. I know it's, for some people, might already be a relatively long week. How many people actually came to my session on Monday, the three-hour session we did on Monday? A large number of you, okay, but not all of you. So we're going to see some of the, what we saw on Monday, and for some of you, you're probably thinking, that's good, I didn't catch all that, that guy talks too fast, I realize that. Um, but I'm going to focus more in this session specifically on microservices and microservices patterns. We're going to show you a bunch of different ways to manage your microservices, orchestrate your microservices, things like that. Because at the end of the day, writing a microservice is actually not that hard. We'll show you that too. We can show you some of the code for sure. It's the way you manage your microservices is where it gets super interesting. Um, but we're going to have some fun, hopefully. You guys will tell me if we don't have some fun. But I got a lot of things to show you and a lot of uh, content to cover. But by show of hands, how many people here already build some form of microservices, do some microservices? OK, look, if you would, look around the room a little bit. Keep your hands up. The majority are already doing microservices. So it's great you came to an introduction to microservices talk. <laughs> and I'm hoping what I show you in this talk, you kind of go, hmm, maybe I'm not fully doing microservices just yet. OK? Because my guess is, uh, for those of you with your hands up, actually, put your hands back up. People are doing microservices. Excellent. How many people are doing Spring Boot? Keep your hands up. OK, about half. All right. So my guess is a lot of you guys are doing Spring Boot. You go, ah, I do Spring Boot. I do microservices. Right? Those two equal each other. That's fair, too. I'm not going to really you know, debunk that idea. But we're going to show you some things that might make you think. OK? We're also going to show you something about reactive programming and how you build reactive server-side components. Uh, we spent a lot of time on that on Monday. We'll show you some of the same kind of things you saw there. I did build a new demo overnight to kind of make that point a little bit richer, I hope, uh, specifically around Rx Java and Vertex. All right, and Vertex is a product or a technology that we specifically have been sponsoring at Red Hat now for a number of years. Just to give you a little background history on Vertex, because a lot of people don't know it, it was uh, Tim Fox used to work for, for JBoss and Red Hat. I've been at uh, JBoss, Red Hat now for 11 years. And so Tim Fox was part of the team. He did Hornet Q, did all these amazing things. And then he kind of moved on to VMware, right? And was part of that spring team, the pivotal team, the, the VMware team, if you will. That's where he gave birth to Vertex. And then he decided he wanted to come back to Red Hat. Um, this sometimes happens in the open source universe. But when he came back to Red Hat, he wanted, of course, still continue working on Vertex. We wanted him to continue working on Vertex. And so Vertex was moved to an independent third party, right? The Eclipse Foundation. So basically, the Ecl uh, uh, Vertex is an Eclipse project, specifically, that Red Hat has engineers working on. So that's often how Red Hat works, is right? We provide the salaries and the, the people to work on different open source projects. So let's dive into this, and hopefully we'll find some interesting stuff to look at, OK? A couple things to notice is these slides are available at the URL at the bottom here. This bit.ly link is super important. If you want the slides, go. you can look at them right now. You can, can't edit them. They should be read-only. But I'm basically running that same deck as you see it. All right, so let's get started. I'm here because of developers.redhat.com. We are specifically a, uh, a subgroup within Red Hat that's out there to talk to developers, discover their needs, ensure that we're building everything possible to, to, to make your journey towards open source, your journey towards using Red Hat technologies, Red Hat sponsored technologies, as easy as possible. And you're about to see a whole lot of different technologies in this one presentation. So let's keep going here. These are numerous projects that we support at Red Hat. So a lot of people think, oh, Red Hat, Linux. Yeah, we do that. Or they think, oh, JBoss, app servers. Yeah, we do that. But we do a whole lot of other things, too, like we sponsor Vertex, as an example. But we also sponsor a ton of other projects. And we're going to see some of these projects as we go. But the list goes on and on and on based on the projects that you might be interested in. So let's talk about the developer evolution. I always like putting a little historical you know, lesson into the presentation. So back in the 70s, we, as developers, only had to know like three things. We had to have three skills, COBOL, JCL, or WIFL. You didn't do JCL and WIFL in most cases. If you had a Unisys mainframe like I did, you did WIFL, workflow language, right? And if you had an IBM mainframe, you did job control language, JCL. But you only had to know those th basic skills. And COBOL is a fairly simple language, if you think about it, running batch-based applications back in the day. So our lives were fairly easy, I think, back in the 70s. OK? I didn't program in the 70s, just so you know. I know it may look a little older, but. In the 80s, however, right, I did do programming in the 80s, and there we learned things like C. Maybe some people got in C++. Some people might have been in small talk, things like that. But mostly it was a C-based world from what I saw of it. We also had a lot of 4GLs back then. I did a lot of 4GL work. We had a lot of CASE back then, computer-aided software engineering. This, is w this well predates UML, right? Well, it's before the Rational Unified Process. It's before all that. It's when we really thought you could draw pictures to generate code, and we did. It was really bad code. Um, but that was the world we lived in. I was also a NetWare administrator 
here back in the day. Remember NetWare? Okay? But this is the set of skills you might have had to have as a good, solid software developer in the 80s. If you had these skills, you got a great paycheck, you did fine. Okay? In the 90s, it got a little more complicated. In the 90s, we had to start learning HTTP and HTML. Right? There was no CSS back then, but we had to learn HTTP. All we knew was get and post and maybe a frame, frame set. Um, but you might learn CGI, Common Gateway Interface. You might have also figured out cookies, and you realized cookies were not evil. I used to have to explain to people that cookies were not evil. They were not going to steal your credit card numbers in 1986. And I say that, I was in Belgium at the time, in 1987, explaining that to a huge audience of people that cookies were not evil. Um, it was interesting. But you also might have picked up Java back in the day there. You might have picked up servlets and EJBs. And you might have learned Windows NT, right? You might have not been wholly on Unix at that point. You might have also ran on Windows servers at that point, too. And you probably had a desktop Windows machine in the, in the mid-90s uh, mid there, for sure. But it gets more interesting. So in the OOs, yeah? It's kind of funny how those decades change. We then had to pick up MVC primarily through struts. Now we use Spring MVC primarily. We also picked up dependency injection, like, again, Spring. We picked up ORM through the Hibernate project. Now we see open source having a massive impact on the technologies we have to know as developers and the set of techniques and skills we have to know growing that much further. Okay, we might have learned some Agile principles. We might have learned some Ajax in, you know, 2006, something like that. Back when we used to call it Ajax. We learned about automated testing. We learned about CI, maybe. But we'll hear more about CI in a second. And then, of course, in the tens, we might have picked up things like HTML5. We might have had to do mobile. We might have had to do IoT. On Monday, I showed a really cool IoT demo, demo right, where we actually took sensor data, streaming it through a series of sensors into the laptop, and then, of course, graphing it out in the browser. That is now part of our world, right, where you might have to deal with sensor streams as well as mobile input. And there's potentially billions, if not trillions, of devices now that could hook up to our software. But this is the world where we now see you know, reactive and functional programming coming into play. What is reactive programming? You'll see some of that in the presentation. Uh, it's just another way to write your code, specifically in an asynchronous, non-blocking way. Typically, async code is hard. right? It's hard to reason about. It's hard to look at. It's hard to get your head around. Uh, but we've cleaned up a bunch of that, and hopefully you guys will see, get a chance to see it. You'll see Arcs, Java. You'll see Vertex. And maybe that'll make the case for maybe learning some reactive programming models. OK, if you do all this, you're like the mythical beast, the pink unicorn with the rainbow mane. This is the GitHub unicorn. But you know, if you think about it, you're gainfully employed. You're employed forever, making great money and doing cool stuff. Um, but you can see the skill set we've had to learn over the last few decades continues to grow. And that is no longer changing. So my point with all this is you guys are going to have to continue learning. And that's good for all of us. So let's jump right in. In the case of microservices, OK? You must be this tall. This is Martin Fowler. I had my own version of this. I decided to use Martin's in this case. Martin Fowler specifically says, you must be this tall, which if you've ever been to an amusement park, you might have wanted to get on the roller coaster. And I'm not very tall. I know I look very small now with you guys way up there. But I was that kid who couldn't get on the roller coaster. I wasn't tall enough. You know, you had to be this tall to get on the ride. Same idea between here and microservices. If you do not have self-service on-demand elastic infrastructure already, you're really not ready to get on the microservices train. Now, for those, since everybody in here pretty raised their hand that they're doing microservices, I ask you this. How many people here can get a new VM spun up in, let's say, 30 seconds? OK, all right, very good. So there's like six of you in this audience here. How many people does it normally take a week or two to get a new VM provisioned within your IT shop? All right, and you can, don't be embarrassed. It's actually OK. You're among friends. OK? How many people are beyond three weeks getting new VMs stood up in their IT shop? OK? And actually, these numbers are pretty good. I've been to a lot of organizations where they are six weeks and beyond to get a new virtual machine stood up. If that is what you have in your shop today, you have a problem. If you can't get a new VM stood up in minutes, there's a challenge someplace within your architecture, within your operational infrastructure, within your concept of DevOps, right? There is no DevOps in that case, because ops is not helping you if you're a developer. So you've got to solve that riddle, and it's actually a, a non-trivial one to solve, because it actually has nothing to do with technology. It's all about governance. It's all about senior management. It's all about culture. But starting up some form of self-service on-demand infrastructure is one of the most fundamental, trivial things you can do to get your development to move faster. The fact that an expensive resource like a software developer has to wait three weeks to get a resource they need, it's kind of insane if you think about it. If you have to wait a week to get a resource you need, is it still insane? If you have to wait five minutes, OK, that's reasonable. We often wait five minutes for a cup of coffee to brew. We can wait five minutes for a VM to brew, OK? 
The next point here is dev versus ops, okay? Who is on the pager for production? Another key test I believe in the microservices world is that developers are now accountable for the software in production. We have to hold ourselves accountable, we have to be accountable. And when I used to manage a software engineering team, I found out that if you basically had bug fix Saturday every Saturday after a Friday night deployment, there are no more bugs going out on Friday night. People fix the crap that they own. When it's developers and operators over here, and the developers think they can throw their software over the wall on Friday evening, and the operators have to make that bad boy run all weekend, and the developers are out drinking, yeah, there's lots of bugs in that software. When the developers are there all weekend too, a lot less bugs the next time around. I guarantee it. So dev versus ops has to go away. It has to be dev and ops working together. It doesn't mean you have to reorg your uh, organizational chart, but you have to fundamentally be accountable for your software and production. So when you hear the concept of a two-pizza team, you hear about what all these Silicon Valley companies are doing, one of the key differences, or if not the key difference, is developers own it in production. They're on the pager, not the operators. The developer's the first line of defense that gets that phone call when anything goes sideways, not the operator. So that's a huge one. Automation. Maybe you've heard of the concept of Phoenix server versus a Snowflake server, right? The Phoenix server is one you can burn down to the ground and bring back to life through a script within moments. A Snowflake server is a delicate little snowflake, only one of its kind, where somebody SSH'd into that machine, doctored up all the init D scripts or system, uh, system D stuff, maybe even started a few processes and left them in the background, you know, disconnected from an SSH standpoint, and that's what the Snowflake looks like, and no one knows how it works. And if you reboot it, it does not come back to life correctly. And this sounds kind of crazy, but you know, if you've been around the uh, IT world long enough, You've seen a lot of these servers. I was talking specifically to a group of people. They're like, we have no idea if we can reboot any of our servers. They have no idea if after a reboot, it'll come back to life. So keep that in mind. OK? Now, CICD, we have a little bit more on CICD. It's super critical. And actually, let's jump right into CICD, OK? So this guy named Jez Humble did this book called Continuous Integration, Continuous Delivery. And he has a very specific set of tests. And you guys will help me out here. How many people know that in their uh, repo, I'm going to assume you all have source control of some sort, right? We're no longer the pragmatic programmer error where only 60% of people had source control. We know when we used to email the sources back and forth to each other, that was our version control. I'm, I'm sure we're beyond that now, right? I won't ask for a show of hands, because someone's still emailing their source code, I know. But how many people know that their trunk and their source control is ready for production, always deployable? All right, good, good, good. So you're, you're ready, always ready to go. And also, everyone on your team is checking into trunk daily. How many people passed that test to? OK, we're down to a few of you. OK, we're still doing pretty good. And if the build breaks, you know that everybody, it's all hands on deck to fix that build within 10 minutes. How many people have that one? OK. All right, but you guys see these tests here, and there's not too many people with hands up any longer. These are, tough, these are tough things to actually overcome, and this is what Jez would tell you. You're not really doing CI unless you're doing these things, right? If you have feature branches that developers are sitting on for weeks at a time, that is not continuous integration. That's a feature branch. It's a whole different thing, OK? So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, a new engineer would be onboarded within a few minutes, right? Maybe a day. It doesn't take long for them to get set up on their new laptop. How many people you know, does it take longer than, let's say, a day or two to get a new engineer signed up to the team, a new software developer? All right, a fair number of you still. So hopefully these points make, make some sense. For a lot of people out there, if I actually said, by show of hands, how many people are using CI, pretty much every hand would go up. Most of you probably using Jenkins as an example but most of you cannot pass these tests doing real CI. So this is the culture of CI, this is the principles of CI, not specifically the tools associated with CI, okay? We'll keep going. If you haven't read these books, I highly encourage you to do so. They're kind of fun books to read and very, very interesting. So the Phoenix Project, the DevOps Handbook are specifically wonderful when it comes to getting your head around, getting your culture, getting your organization on target to building software better, faster, okay? now. I want to show you, I'm going to quickly talk about a technology called Fabricate. It's fairly new from the perspective of what we're doing with it when Red Hat. And if you're interested in CICD, if you're interested in DevOps, this is kind of CICD in a wizard, CICD in a box. And what it specifically allows you to do is pick your stack, like you could pick your stack in the case of a Camel integration, a Go project, Spring Boot project, a Vertex project, Wildfly Swarm project, et cetera. And it's going to lay down the Docker file for you and the stack you need to make that happen. And then it's also going to set up a CICD pipeline for you and I can zoom in on some of this. You can see it also does CICD pipelines with canary deployments and rolling upgrades. And I'll show you some of this live here in a second. Um, and then, of course, it allows you to run that pipeline. You can see right here. 
So that's, of course, a Jenkins pipeline. It integrates Jenkins, it integrates Git, it integrates Nexus, et cetera, so that you have the full environment ready to go within moments. And because if you've ever tried to set up all the stuff we've been talking about, it can take you weeks to get it all configured correctly. So that's a project I encourage you to look at uh, if you're interested in like, getting more CICD DevOps ready. Again, this is focused on the tools, not the culture. The culture matters more. But at least if you have some tools, you might get further along. OK? OK. What do we have here? Let's see here. All right. Let's move along more fast, uh, faster. So this is the monolithic architecture we're used to. We're used to an operating system with a Java virtual machine. We're used to having an app server. That's what we've had historically. We put our big old fat ears in that app server, and maybe those ears had wars and jars and numerous other components. And in some cases, we've seen multi-megabyte ears. We've seen maybe even a gigabyte ear or two. Anybody here have over a gigabyte ear? No. Oh, just one gentleman. Was that painful to have a gigabyte ear? Not, oh, you need more. You need a two gigabyte ear. <laughs> I mean, it's more than just painful. <laughs> it's more than painful. OK, but yes, uh, so we've had this issue. And here's the tricky part with this architecture that we you know, kind of promoted throughout the Java E history, J2E history, is that everyone in this world has to agree to this full stack, this full architecture. So in other words, we all have to agree to the same JVM, the same app server, the same configuration of the app server, and all the data sources and the J JMS queues and all the other security parameters, the same settings at the JVM level for XMX, right, heap, and everything else, the same settings at the operating system, same patch level. We had to agree all on that architecture. And the part that really got us burned, we were fine with that, because somebody in the ivory tower of enterprise architecture set the standard for the stack, so we were good there. But it's when we all had to agree to the exact same versions of the jars we use from Maven Central. That has screwed us up many, many times. And organizations that are fairly large, they'll have 35 versions of Spring in production, as an example. We couldn't get agreement there, and that's been very problematic. And it's problematic because you have large teams, teams that basically work on this big old monolithic guy, right? They basically work on this architecture. You might have 18 programmers and six operators, three DBAs, but they're a large team. In this new world of microservices, it's not about the software, it's about the team structure. So that's one thing that's super fundamental. If you take anything away from this presentation, it's not about the software, it's about the team. If you can break up the team, which means you need to have a smaller code base, because a small team can't manage a big code base, then you have something that's potentially magical. Then you have something that potentially makes your lives vastly easier. So if you're a 40-person team or an eight-person team, makes a huge difference in how you actually build your software, especially if those eight people are wholly accountable for that software in production. So that's really what the two pizza team means. You can feed these teams off two American-sized pizzas, not european size, but American-sized pizzas. And then that's six to eight people or so, maybe 10 people. And they will work on their component as if it's a product, not a project. They'll deploy it in production when it's ready to go to production, maybe every day if that's what they need, because they own it in production. They're a service provider. They're a SaaS, software as a service at that point. And this is how your teams have to operate within a typical IT shop if you really want to go fast. Right? The whole reason we care about microservices is to go faster to production, and we go faster by having smaller teams that are more accountable. Okay? These are the key principles of microservices. Deployment independence is number one. Just keep that in mind. I and my little team have to be able to deploy our component when we need to deploy it with zero disruption to the rest of the architecture. And I'll show you an example of that when we get to the demonstration so you can see how that works. So independence of deployment is super critical. The coding is actually not that hard. Deployment independence is actually really hard. Okay? Now, there's a couple other things here that are also very important. We don't have a lot of time for them. But one I'd call out to you is this decentralized data management. Because people are going to go, what? You mean we can't have our monolithic Oracle database with our six DBAs who sit around like uh, druids at Stonehenge, you know, with their cowled hoods on, with their burning flames over this database we call Oracle? Yeah, you can't have that anymore. Okay? Because they're the roadblock in the whole organization. They're the ones who always say no to every change you want to make. No, you can't change that schema. No, you can't add that new capability. I don't care what the users want. We're not changing the production database. How many people have heard that? Yeah, okay, I'll give you one tip. You're not gonna be able to fix the personality of those DBAs, but keep in mind, they could have been just like you. They're techies too. Maybe you should buy them a fake lightsaber and take them to lunch, okay? And you think I'm kidding? It works. <laughs> Make them your friend, they'll put your schema changes in faster, but let's... <laughs> now. We actually have a book that's up and coming. I'm kind of pre-announcing here. Uh, Yanaga here, Edson, is going to be actually working on a book specifically related to this issue. How do you deal with the monolithic database? He doesn't deal with the pizza and the lightsaber factor, I don't believe. You didn't put that in there, did you? 
Okay, but you'll have real technical strategies for how you deal with your schema and how you deal with, you know, essentially, uh, you know, managing a multi-database architecture, distributing data around the enterprise. At a, at, a, at a core level, microservices have these key features that you need to think about as you go through it. Your software is your software, your code is your code, all right? There's not much delta in the code itself, but there's a lot of delta around the code. Like you need some form of service discovery. How does service A find service B? Now that we've broken up our monolith into two or three or four or 500 pieces, how does A find B? You need some form of resilience architecture because if A calls B and B fails, does A also fail? You'd rather not, as an example. You'd rather A keep working, and so we'll show you that. You need to think in terms of APIs. You have a public API that you're married to. You're a software as a service provider. You're a product owner. You own it in production. You guarantee backward compatibility of your API all the time. That's how you have to think as a developer in this architecture. Okay? You got to think through the invocation model. Most people are using HTTP today. Some people want to use messaging of some sort. Uh, we'll show you just HTTP, just kind of keep it easy. And then tracing, think through your automated build, think through your authentication model. You're like, we have a, a version of this demo that has all single sign on across all the microservices if you want to look at that. Uh, monitoring and logging. So these are the things you'll see part of this in our demo based on the amount of time we have today. Okay? A couple patterns we'll show you real quick. This one will sound kind of wonky to some of you. You're thinking, what? That can't be a proper way people do microservices, and I find it all over the place. So in other words, what people are doing is they're building several server-side components, and they're exposing them all through port 80 or 8080 or whatever their port, you know, mostly 80, I guess, at this point, and the browser is simply talking to them all. The browser is responsible for aggregating them all. The browser has the business logic, the mobile browser or the mobile app, right, that basically calls API 1, 2, 3, 4, collects the data in the way it needs, and then puts it out on the user interface. This is super common. Now, you guys are probably thinking that's not proper. And I understand that, but this is the way a lot of retailers do it, OK? So I've seen a lot of retailers do it this way. This is actually how I learned this idea was I got it explained to me by a very large retail organization. It's like, no, this is how we do it. And they have millions upon millions of end users, so it seems to work for them. I think at one point they actually advertised 200 concurrent million users on Black Friday. It's that kind of company, OK? So this is how they do it. You know, so basically, each component of the user interface likely has some other microservice on the back end. And this is literally how they do it, because they have to have a specialized pricing engine that's a separate system. They have an inventory control system that literally goes to a mainframe. And they do all this asynchronously from the browser side's perspective. They basically make all these calls independently of each other. So they can collect the data, and the user interface fills in as it can. If, in fact, one of these things fail, you just don't see that in the user interface. That's the way they support their microservices architecture. That might be what you guys want to do. So in the case of this one, where it fails on location-based availability here, you can see the in-store pickup, 15 available. It looks at your GPS and says, based on the store near you, you might have one available. If that fails, it just uses the GPS to say, hey, you might have a store near you. We don't know your availability of the inventory because that system failed. Okay? And you have to plan for failure in this architecture. When you have a distributed architecture of any sort, and in this case, like a mobile app or a mobile client, it is likely to fail. And it's not even your fault that 3G connection failed, right? It wasn't your fault. Maybe your service is still up, or maybe it was just overwhelmed. So just keep that in mind, okay? Another idea, another one is a lot of people refer to this as the API gateway. Some refer to it as the edge service. Instead of having the browser aggregate all that business logic, they push it back to the server and let the server aggregate that business logic. This is also very common. And you might build this with like Node.js. It's really popular to do Node.js this way as their API layer. Um, but we're also seeing a ton of people using Vertex for the same architecture, because Vertex and Node.js have the same architecture. It's based on the event loop, all async non-blocking. And you want async non-blocking at your edge services because they're so overwhelmed with load. I'll show you an example a demo of that in a second. OK, if that one fails, you've got to stop the failure at this level, right? Makes sense? Now you also have the concept of chaining. If you're familiar with the Netflix architecture, they talk about the fact that any invocation through the user interface may hit 20 to 30 to 50 microservices on the back end. So a single user interface construct may have hit 20 or 30 things just to paint the screen you're looking at right now. In which case, if one of those guys goes down, do you have a cascading failure? You have to plan for that. You have to think about that. So this is where it gets interesting in a microservices architecture. It's, this is where it gets different from a traditional monolithic architecture. You, have to do, you do have to write your endpoints slightly differently to deal with this possible failure, cascading failure. And we'll show you that. And uh, that's specifically part of the circuit breaker architecture. I know I'm moving rather fast because there's some demos I really want to show you. And now's the time to show you. We'll show you the circuit breaker in action as, instead of explaining it. And then you guys can tell me if this makes sense or not. OK, what we're going to do here. Uh, yeah, let's do this. I'm going to run this Spring Boot app. Let's see if I have it running correctly. 
Let me see if I see things correctly. That helps. Okay. We're going to go up here. There we go. Okay, a simple symbol, it, all it does is print a message, right? I can show you the code, but it's standard spring code. You can see it just responds to my clicks, no problem there, okay? And there's also another API, API nap here, that's actually rather, rather slow. It's doing a long job, and I, I can show you the job. It's just calculating pi to the 20,000 20, uh, decimal points. But it just takes a long time, okay? So you can see it's a little sticky there. Now, what happens is, in a traditional model, enterprise Java model, doesn't matter what it is, I can show you Wildfly Swarm, or I can show you, you know, anything like that. When you hand it with a lot of overwhelming load, let's pound on it here, watch what happens, okay? It just goes to spinning, 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 because all the threads associated with jobs that can be done are in use, and there's a queue available, and you see that my browser just got through the queue. And now if I hit refresh again, like a uh, user is likely to do, it's stuck again because I'm back in the queue. So in this case, I limited it to 100 threads. But 100 threads is a lot, especially on an eight core processor with so much RAM dedicated to it on this laptop. OK? So you got to think in my, every, every thread costs you something, and you have to decide how many of those threads you want. In this case, I allowed for 100. By default, it would have taken about 200. But even at 200, if you have more than 200 concurrent requests that take a little time, you're blocked. This is a standard blocking architecture. And I'm not making fun of Spring in this case. It's, it's, that's Tomcat, right? Here's the Wildfly. It works the same way. Has the exact same challenge. Uh, this is the technology that you know, I came to know and love and came from. But let's see here. Let's go see if we can get that endpoint up. Come on, get up there. All right, so there it is. Same idea there. If I pound it with overwhelming load again, you can see there's the threads happening. All right, and there we wreck the stuck again back in the queue, so I'm in the queue waiting for a thread to take my request, and then I'll get a response. This is what we deal with all the time. This is how we build our applications. And if I show you the code here, there's nothing unusual about it. Uh, let's see if I can find it with all the things I have open uh, here. OK? All right, so the client is super simple. We'll walk back to the client in a second. The, and you guys can certainly tell me if I did this wrong. But we're going to come back to the Vertex version of this. Let's look at. All right, here's the Java E version, right? The Wildfly Swarm version, plain old Java E. Nothing weird here, right? It's just a goodbye, respond with a goodbye, or nap, which does a big job, and then responds. Okay, nothing unusual at all. If I'd gone to a slow database or some other endpoint, it would have worked the same way. Um, and then if I look at the Spring version of this, where's my Spring version? Uh, right here, okay? Same exact business logic. As, as the other, just the spring annotations as opposed to the Java E annotations. And if I look at the Vertex one, we'll show you that next, it looks almost the same, but it is written a little bit differently. And it's written differently because it's all async non-blocking. So let's see if we can run this and uh, get, get this working for you. OK, let's go back over here. There's our client. And where's our server? OK, let's shut that down. Let's bring up the Vertex version of that. And that's coming up now. And I'll go back over here. And now we'll say goodbye. So there's the Vertex version. OK. And if I, again, pound it to death with 200 plus threads, you can see it's still responding. OK. It's a little sticky because my CPU is whacked at this point on this machine. But it's still responding. It's still responsive even in the face of overwhelming load. We're not getting those long pauses. So that's the delta. All right. In this case, the job was put to a background thread. That's what async non-blocking means. You just don't have to worry about that. You don't see it. That's really the delta. And the front end thread, the event loop in this case, is always available to take additional load from the user. So if I look at this code right here, all of that magic is held in this one method invocation, the blocking handler. So if you look at this, this chunk of code here, right, the goodbye business logic, the nap business logic, they look identical to what you had earlier, basically. The delta is how you set up the web router so that you have async non-blocking. And that's one of the magic pieces of Vertex. Okay? So you can see how that looks like. And if you're familiar with uh, Node.js programming, it looks kind of like Node.js. This is kind of where we get these ideas from. But I, want, I don't want to stop there. There's actually some other interesting art parts of this demo that are kind of important to note. Because some of you are thinking, well, the problem is your client's written poorly. I agree. The client's written very poorly. It blocks. It tries to trounce the, data, uh, the system. right? It just basically hammers the server. It has no fail safes in the client. We should have some fail safes. So we thought about that. We actually built a timeout. Because with an Apache client, if you don't set the timeout, it just goes for as long as it goes until TCP times out. In this case, we can say timeout the Apache client. And then uh, that means don't overwhelm the server. But it's an important point. This is subtle. So hopefully it'll make sense when I show it to you. The, let's get this up. 
okay, let's go back over here. Go back to my little Spring Boot app, run it again. Um, and where'd this, where'd this go? Client, okay. Watch what happens this time. All right. So we're going to get this, we're going to time out. So notice the timeout is happening. So, okay, we're falling back over here. Timeout's happening. I'm still stuck from a user standpoint. You can see our browser's still spinning because all my threads are still in use. So yes, we fixed the client. It's responding better. It's not getting data and because it, it's timing out, but the server still had 100 transactions block it, and actually 200 transactions block it. You can see it's still trying to process a transaction for something that there is no one waiting for any longer. So this is also problematic, right? <laughs> you also see where this could be a problem. Now, again, this is standard Java architecture, enterprise Java architecture, nothing weird there. You could write it differently, but this is how we'd normally write a JAX or S endpoint or a Spring MVC endpoint. So you're probably thinking, well, I could, I could be a little bit smarter about that, and you can. And that's really where the circuit breaker called Hystrix comes in, and this is one of the reasons I really like it. Right? Let's show you the Hystrix client, and, uh, and it's just it's fairly straightforward. Here's what it looks like. Okay? It basically has this Fane wrapper around it, and it says localhost 8080, which is the same place my browser is going to. It's going to call the NAP, and then we're going to see if it succeeds or fails. There's a big difference in this one, however. Let's bring up Wildfly Swarm in this case. And where's my browser? Okay. All right. So oh, it's not up yet. Come on, server. There we go. So Wildfly Swarm's up. Now I hit it. Let's go ahead and hit it again from a client standpoint. Now, if you notice what happened, one, thing, one, one huge thing is different. Only 10 threads are active on the server side because Hystrix has a bulkhead built into it. It basically says, look, I'm not getting responses. I'm not going to send all 200 requests to the system. I'm going to send them in in batches and see what kind of response I get. If I don't get a response, I time out immediately. So the client gets an immediate timeout, and the server is not dead. And this is a subtle distinction, but it's a huge distinction if you think about an architecture where you actually have to do distributed communication across multiple servers from A to B to C to D. So this concept of the circuit breaker and Hystrix bulkhead and circuit breaker make a huge difference in your architecture. Does that make sense at all? OK. Was this a good demo to show? Yeah. OK. Um, I, you know, we spent some time thinking about it, and, maybe, and you guys can look at the code in GitHub and say, oh, you just did it horribly, but we just wanted to make the point. A threaded architecture has challenges based with overwhelming load. You don't have much elasticity. An async architecture can certainly scale vastly better, right? It can always be responsive, and what, that's one of the key tenets of being reactive. And in the case of having a Hystrix on the client side, you also protect both ends of the equation. So let's, um, let's show you a more interesting demo now, OK? Uh, you, you're thinking, you have more interesting demos? Yes, I do. I have way more interesting demos. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's do here. I'm going to show you. I've got so many things open. I can't keep up with them all. Uh, we're going to go here. We got the Hystrix monitor. Let's make sure that's ready to go. And I'm going to show you this guy. Where, where'd it go? Oh, it's over here. There we go. Okay, we'll come back to the other guy in a second. Now, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. There we go. All right. If I go here, watch what happens. Uh, let's look at our Bonjour endpoint. There's four pods running. So this is where Docker comes into the equation. We built Docker containers out of our different microservices, run them in Kubernetes. I'm running a local Kubernetes cluster here on this laptop. As you can see, I have a ton of Docker containers running right now. I have a lot. Okay. I have, I have almost an overwhelming amount of Docker containers running. These are all independent app servers is the way to think of them. I have four of that Bonjour endpoint by itself. I have one for the API Gateway, which is a Spring Boot app. I have Aloha, which is Vertex app. I have the front end, which is another Node.js app. Um, I have Kubeflix running, which you'll see that more of that in a second. And you can see that all this is running right here in a single virtual machine, right here in VirtualBox, OK, right there in VirtualBox, all running on this, on this local machine. And it's a Kubernetes cloud for all intents and purposes. This allows me to experiment with microservices principles and key capabilities that I think are important, one of which is a circuit breaker. Okay, So let's show you the concept of the circuit breaker. Here we have the front end. And if you look carefully, I know it's a little hard to see. Let's see if we can bump that up. Okay, If you watch right here, that little piece of text is the host name that server thinks it's running on. So every one of these services thinks it's running on a whole different machine. That's the beauty of having a Docker container. It doesn't realize it's on a highly virtualized Linux container. All right, Not even VMs. This is one virtual machine running on this Mac OS X. It's a uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux virtual machine. And each of these containers is running in their own little machine, it thinks. right? That's the host name you can see right there. So you can see the load balancing that's occurring for free. All right, 
Let's go, where's, where'd that guy go? We're back up here. Okay, there's four of them. So if we look carefully, we'll see four of those guys working. Okay, and if you look over here at my Hystrix dashboard, let's go alphabetical. You see those six green right there? You gotta watch this very carefully. Those are good requests. Hystrix is letting the transaction through the system and it's all good. So if I come over here to my service chaining, remember those patterns we showed you earlier? Okay, so you can see that uh, the browser is calling Ola, which is calling Ola. I know that's Brazilian versus uh, you know, Spanish, right? So we got Portuguese Ola, Spanish Ola, and then you have Aloha, which is Vertex. That, you know, for those who are there on Monday, you know why it's called Aloha. And then Bonjour, right? Our Node.js. And watch what happens if I just hit refresh here. You'll see the little green change. This is the Hystrix monitor here, okay? You can see that green. And you notice the circuit is closed. Closed means good. And the circuit breaker concept is super powerful, super important, but it we use them every day, like in our houses. This ensures our houses don't burn down. It's kind of like the scenario where if you have any teenagers in your house, which I've had several, you would actually have a situation where in the bathroom, they plugged in the hair dryer, their boom box, now they have iPods, I know, but the boom box, they, right? they had a portable heater, and the next thing you know, the circuit kicks off and the lights go off in the whole house. You get, anyone had that happen before? Hair dryer, portable heater. Oh, you guys don't have heaters here. You just, you just have it cold, right? <laughs> but, but seriously, this happens. This happened to me multiple times. And the reason the circuit breaker kicks over is because you're drawing too much through that circuit, right? It's simple, it's simple, too much draw on that. If you actually go put your hand on the circuit, you'll feel it's hot. It's heated up and it flips, right? So it disconnects so that no more power is being drawn to that circuit. And it can decide, you can decide later what went wrong. That's the whole purpose of it, and that's why they call this a circuit breaker. Now, let's have a little fun with it here. Let's, let's see it. So it's working normally. We get some nice green transactions here. We get a circuit that's closed. Let me go kill this guy. All right, we're going to roll it down to zero. I just killed all those Docker containers. They're rolling down now, and watch what happens. Okay, we're at zero, and now you see there's a timeout and a 33% error, right? And, and we have this set for a very short, so you know, it, it basically kicks over quickly. If you notice also, our business logic says fallback. So the user is getting an immediate fallback. Hey, we don't know what's wrong, but something's wrong. And if I keep pounding on it, though, watch what happens. If I really pound on it, the circuit goes open, and now I'm bouncing off more quickly. Because the way the circuit breaker works is if we have a dead guy, stop kicking the dead guy. Go away, and let's see if we can come back to life at some later point. That's really the purpose of Hystrix. That's really the purpose of Circuit Breaker in the bulkhead. It ensures that not every transaction goes through now that we know the guy's dead. That's what open means. It also has a half-open state where it basically says, let me try now. Nope, still dead. You know I mean? We're dead, right? So it does send one, uh, one transaction through every now and then to see if the guy will actually come back to life. And it actually works pretty well, so well, that if I just bring it back to life, okay, you can see there's my guy coming back to life there. And watch this carefully right here. So we got to see it go blue. That's when the server's back up. We're blue. We have a good transaction. One more time. And we have a closed circuit. We're back to life again. So that, you just get that for free with Hystrix. OK? It's not that hard. And you get the little monitor here, too, which is kind of cool to see what your circuit breakers look like. But this might be where if you see one thing and you do some microservices and you don't have a circuit breaker, go do this, OK? Whenever something calls something else across a wire, they, people even use this for JDBC connections, right? The JDBC driver may get jacked up. How do I deal with that, right? It often gets jacked up. You have an Oracle database with those DBAs that you won't buy lightsabers for, right? You might need to put this between you and them as a safeguard that's sure that you can speed things up. All right, let's, uh, let's keep going here. We got, a lot, we got a lot to cover. Yeah, I want to actually, let's go and show you the rest of these things while we're here, okay? So go back over here. Okay, we showed, there's the different patterns. We mentioned those already. Let's show you this one. Okay, this is my API gateway. It's based on Spring Boot. Let me see if I can find that code over here in my long list of pieces of code. Or is it this one? I think it is this one. Okay, so that's, that's Bonjour, by the way. We'll come back to it in a second. But where is my API gateway, my little Spring Boot app? Here it is. Okay, there it is. Uh, okay, let's make, we're going to make a change to it. So right now, if you notice, the API gateway just says, the, it makes the invocation of all the other endpoints, so Aloha, Bonjour, Ola, Ola, right? Uh, let's do this. Let's call this JFocus. All right, and it's actually lowercase f, isn't it? Get that right. OK, we hit Save there. So I'm making a code change. Obviously, I've not pushed to production yet. Let's find our, let's find our, let's do this. Uh, poll, 
API gateway just to kind of see, you know, where it's pulling it. The same thing, the same endpoint, same REST endpoint you saw over there in the browser. And if I can find my other screen here, nope, not that one. This is the problem with having too many windows open. Okay, come on, we're up. It is this one, here we go. So here it is, let's do our Maven package. Okay, we gotta do a Maven build, right? It is a Maven project, we gotta do our Maven, there it goes, okay? So we're doing a build there, all right? And then let's push it into production. And actually, we were gonna push blue into production. So green, the one we're hitting right now, is still gonna work. And this is what the, one of those crazy tricks you can do when you have an architecture that's highly elastic and highly uh, you know, or orchestratable, if you will, for lack of a better term, like Kubernetes. In this case, I have a microservice already running out there. I'm pushing a second version of the microservice into the production environment, but no user's actually seeing it. So let's see here. All right, so I'm still on the old one, okay? Look, so here's my little polar, it's still on the old one, yeah? But watch what happens if I flip the route. And I just have a little script here that I flip the route, boom. Oh, and I didn't, I made, I still have my previous change in there. Let's see here. But you can see so that's the previous change. Why did that not change? Let's see here, am I in the right directory? Yeah, it's just a fat jar. Okay, there it is. Uh, did I update the right jar? Maybe I didn't do the right build. This is what happens when you have too many of these things up here. API gateway. All right. Normally, I can make that build work. Why is it? I may have misfired it. I did the package. Yeah, I think I did all the right steps. OK. Oh, there it is. It just took a second longer. Here. <laughs> there we go. OK, but if you want to step back, right? let's say you're like, oh, I don't want that in production. That was the wrong one. You're back. Back to the original. Your user is going to see the old stuff. So that concept of the blue-green deployment, you have two copies of your microservice in production. You make a change to the one. You decide by moving a little traffic to it if it's good or not good. And if it's you know, all good, send all traffic to it. If it's bad, send your traffic back. So that concept of either having blue or green is a hugely powerful thing. And if you use something like Docker containers running in Kubernetes, it's not that hard to implement a blue-green strategy. Now, you might not think you actually need this, right? Your system isn't well, it's not highly overloaded. There's not a ton of users on the application. There's 25 concurrent users at peak time on Monday when everyone signs in, that kind of thing. I realize that. However, if you're doing microservices, you're doing it because you want to go faster. If you want to go super fast, like you want to deploy every week, you want something like this to help you go faster because this gives you confidence of pushing what's in trunk directly into production with no outage. That's when we said earlier, if you're doing CI for real, trunk is always ready for production, always ready to deployable. Literally, people check in every day, so every code commit you make could go to production. And you don't send any traffic to it, no users have to see it, but you know if it lives or dies. And actually, that's the next pattern I want to show you. It's one that's a little bit more particular, and that is the canary pattern. OK, uh, let's go over here. That's this, bon we played Canary with Bonjour. So let's go look at that one real quick. Um, we're nearly out of time, aren't we? Are we doing OK? Oh, man, I feel like I'm moving too slow here. But where's my Bonjour? Let's see. OK, here's Bonjour. Let's see if we can get them fixed up. Let's make him a J Focus too, right? J Focus. All right. And uh, let's get that to do a build. OK, break out this loop, bump, 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 pull, bonjour. Ah, helps if you say bonjour there. So that's the bonjour endpoint. You can kind of see it right here, right? We're just hitting the bonjour endpoint. OK, there's only one of them running right now. I'm doing my build on the, uh, that was a Node.js, right? So bonjour is Node.js right here. You can see it's Node. And so I'm just doing another build. This is doing a Docker build, OK, just like a Docker image being created, being pushed up into Kubernetes. In our case, uh, we support, we're the second largest contributor to Kubernetes outside of Google at Red Hat, and we support that through a technology called OpenShift, it's Kubernetes. And I'm basically now gonna push that image into my Kubernetes um, environment here. And so it's getting pushed up, and the delta is though, it's going as a canary. Now, you guys might have heard the concept of the canary in the coal mine. All right, we'll, we'll let that guy finish. Oh, and actually, let's do this. Let's go ahead and scale up our bonjour while we're hanging out here. Let's get that up to four. So I'm going to run it up to four of those application servers real quick. So it's about that hard. That's the nice thing about having Docker containers. You say, I want four of those. I want 12 of those. I want two of those. And Kubernetes is ensuring that you have that right balanced across your entire cluster. If you have 10 servers, it'll ensure you have four across the 10 kind of thing, if that's what you want. Um, 
But the nice thing about the canary, in the principle of the canary, it may not apply here in Sweden, but it's kind of a big deal in Kentucky in the United States. Because we have a lot of coal miners in the United States. And the coal mining, I don't know if you guys have ever seen it or seen pictures of it, they have to go well under the earth to dig out coal. And the coal is, you know, maybe a 300 meters down below the surface. And when they get down there, when they're digging for coal, they might actually tap into a natural gas line also, because they tend to be near each other, right? They're kind of both of the same byproduct. So they tap into a natural gas line, meaning it's just a piece of, uh, oh, it is, we're about out of time. They, they suffocate and die, so they take a canary with them as an example, okay? So when they do that, that could be very problematic. The canary dies, they need to get the hell out of the mine. So the idea is you do the same thing with your operational concerns. Let's see if we can spin this up now. And let's see how, if our canary lives or dies. So I'm bringing up one of the canaries, and there's four of these guys. So there's four of the previous one, and one of the new one. And if it comes to life correctly, there's our J-focus. You're going to see the load balancing occur. So one of every four or one of every five requests gets the J-focus version of it. And if I decide, whoa, I don't want that version of production, I can roll it right back as an example. OK? So we only have a couple minutes left, it, it turns out. So let's show you a couple other things here. We kind of walked you through a ton of microservices principles, deployment patterns, but we got to show you some code too, right? That would be more interesting. So in this case, I want to show you a piece of code that I just worked on, because um, it's super interesting from the perspective of how do you deal with microservices again. So in the case of microservices, you often are having a service A call service B, OK? And so in this case, I literally am doing that. I'm going to have a microservice that comes up on port 8080. Let's go and bring up a browser. and. OK, let's, OK, that works. And what it's doing is it's basically an aggregation endpoint hitting other services. So if we look at these other services, it's basically making a call to 8081 for users. So if I go to localhost uh, 8081 slash users, I get that list. OK, it's then making a call to 8082 for followers. And if I go to localhost 8082 followers and a specific follower, it gets that data. But on this endpoint, it aggregates it all. And this actually will work against the GitHub API. I have it working off localhost right here. But this is an example of RxJava allowing me to make that client-side invocation, getting observables back, and doing all this async non-blocking. And so if you have to make calls across the wire, this makes it a ton, ton easier. If you're dealing with AngularJS or RxJS, right? AngularJS 2.0 includes RxJS. You're used to this code already. This is what your client-side developers are doing already with Angular 2. You can do it on the server side also, in this case, with uh, a piece of Java code. Oh, man, we really are nearly out of time, aren't we? Let's see if there's anything. Uh, there's one more thing i got to show you guys, because we're going to have a little fun here. OK? So we talked about Vertex. We kind of didn't do much justice, you know, give you a lot of introduction to it. But it is a full platform for you to build out whole enterprise applications fully in an async, non-blocking way. That includes async database drivers, async integration with the DNS, async integration across the board. You know, so certainly take advantage of that. Uh, we'll keep going here. These are the key principles of being reactive, and they're super simple. Be responsive. You saw an example of responsiveness already. Be elastic. You saw an example of that in the demonstration. You're right. We can scale easily up and down. Be resilient in the case of failure, because failure will happen in distributed architecture. You saw that in the demonstration also. And be message driven. That should be fairly obvious. OK, you saw these principles, hopefully, in the demonstration itself. One thing I want to do, though, before we run out of time, because it's, it's going to be fun. OK, let's run this demonstration. We did it on Monday. I want to do it for you guys again. But basically, I'm going to show you an example of a microservices architecture with a full Vertex system on the back end and what it can do for you. We're going to run a real-time game. And the game has an um, uh, uh, admin screen, a user screen, and of course, different screens for actually doing the, the, uh, actually doing the um, dashboards. All right? So let's get the scoreboard up here. Let me get my leaderboard up here. You guys can go to demo.bird.red. Uh, demo OK, and actually have some prizes for the winners. So you'll, you'll want to get in there. Let's go here. And let's hit start, 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 start. All right. OK. All right, looks like we already have eight players in, nine players in. Already popping some balloons there. You should be popping those balloons on your phone. And where's my other screen? I've lost it somewhere along the way. Here, let's just bring it up. Uh, Demo.bird.scoreboard. OK. Oh, wait, we already had a scoreboard up. Leaderboard. And this is an example of real-time game, all WebSocket-based, all async, all microservices back in. There you guys are up on the leaderboard. But you can see the pops you're making are having real-time changes on our screen here. And I can also have real-time changes with you, OK? Like if I really wanted your attention, I could pause you, OK? 
So think about that for a second. What can you do with your applications with this kind of right, capability? And again, it's all async non blocking. Let me start you back up again, and I'll actually make some changes, make this a little bit easier. Let's give you bigger, fatter balloons. Uh, uh, red are 10. I'll add the golden snitch and give you a background change as well. And then go. All right. Now you got bigger, fatter balloons. And you can score points. You notice that you're getting notifications also based on your point totals. And you can see here on the dashboard that's changing in real time based on how you're performing. So that's an example of a reactive, async, non-blocking application, all microservices architecture. All this is on GitHub, all the code, by the way. This is just running on a single VM instance uh, at EC2 right now. And you can see it's handling a fair bit of load just based on the people we have playing right now. 73 of you playing, 77,000 transactions through that architecture. Because each balloon pop is a transaction all the way through the back end into our Drools rules engine, making a calculation of your achievement back out to the browser to let you know your score and out to these browsers to let everyone see the uh, composite score. Now we're out of time, aren't we? All right, fantastic. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to game over. All right? And if you're in the top 10, come see me. I have something for you. So thank you guys very much for your time. If you have any questions, feel free to hit me up on Twitter or come see me afterwards. Thank you.